Hello, I'm Mike Sheehan. Matty Richardson is one of my all-time favourites because when Richo's out in the middle, I know it's going to be entertaining. He has been Richmond's most popular and best player in a generation. Let's reflect on his 17-year journey. Welcome to Fox Sports, Matthew. Good to be here. How does it feel to be the AFL's most popular player? I don't know if that's uh, correct, Mike, but uh, oh, look, I reckon as my career's gone on, I feel, uh, feel like I've harboured a bit more support off people, I guess. I can remember periods when there was the normal sort of love Richo, hate Richo, but it seems now you're sort of everyone's favourite. Well, I think once you get to be the oldest player in the AFL, as a lot of people have reminded me this year, I think uh, people start feeling sorry for you. So. <laughs> well, I, I know on Brownlow Middle Night they weren't feeling sorry for you. I mean, most of the people were willing you across the line. I actually felt sorry for Adam Cooney. I mean, here's the bloke who's winning a Brownlow and knowing everyone in the room wanted someone else to win it. Tell us yeah, what that feeling was like. I think I just had a pretty a fun night, fairly relaxed night, because I knew the last two games I hadn't performed at all. I knew I wouldn't get votes. I mean, I was 100% certain of that. So. I knew I probably wouldn't get there, so I felt fairly relaxed because I didn't have the nerves of thinking I was going to uh, win. So yeah, I was pretty uh, relaxed and it was a good night and there was a lot of support in the room and I was really appreciative for that. Uh, rate the year 2008 with the other 16 that you've played, or 15 that you'd played before, to that point. Uh, in what regard? Well, just in, in, in the level of excellence. Uh, as far as playing, I think it was one of my more consistent seasons. I think most weeks I got a pretty, you know, pretty familiar result each week. I think I was consistent. Uh, I think I had better, more, you know, outstanding games in other years. But as far as consistency, I reckon that was up there with the most. Yeah. Seventeen seasons at one club, Matty, says a lot about your durability and your loyalty. But it's produced only three finals. Cyril Rioli was 19 with three finals and a premiership to his name at the end of last year. Oh, thanks for pointing that out, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's disappointing, obviously. 17 years, a lot of hard work's gone into it, and, you know, you get your reward, obviously, by playing in finals. So, as far as that goes, so I guess you'd look at it as a failure to play three finals in 17 years, and uh, it's very disappointing. But, you know, there has been some, some good players over the years that haven't played finals footy, and it, I guess you just got to be in the right place place at the right time sometimes. Do you ever regret spending your entire career at Richmond? No, not really. I mean, I'm, I'm proud to be a one club player and uh, Richmond's been, I guess, my life since I was a young kid. My father played there and I supported the club my whole life. All my heroes were Richmond people. So I certainly don't regret staying at Richmond. I certainly regret that I haven't played more finals football. You ever get close to uh, leaving? No, not really. I think there were a couple of times there where I was out of contract and I got to the point where I probably had one discussion with a couple of clubs, but it never got to the point of sitting down and looking at numbers and, and really seriously contemplating it. Matthew, it's a tough, demanding game on and off the field. Has it yeah. got worse as we've gone on? Oh, tenfold, tenfold, I think. Uh, but players have got to accept that. A lot more money in the game now, a lot more you know, media exposure with the, the TV rights, so they're going to want their stories. But uh, as a young guy starting now, it's the demands on them now uh, are, you know, pretty high. Pretty high to expect young guys to never make mistakes. And, you know, when I was 18, 19, we could go out, you know, Saturday night and have a big night and, you know, get home and have a few hours sleep and then you'd be, you know, somewhere and have a Sunday session. And that everyone was doing it and it wasn't a big deal. But, you know, young guys now barely get the chance to, to go out and socialise with their mates. and. When they do, they probably you know, drink too much because in between they have about six or seven weeks where they haven't been able to do anything and they get one opportunity and they think, gee, I've probably got to have as many here as I can. So that's probably a little bit of an issue. Um, and just the constant uh, pressure on them to never muck up. And I would hate to have that as an 18 year old because you're going to make mistakes when you're that age. Can they actually enjoy the game or has it become almost a chore and, and, and sort of this, this scrutiny yeah, that's, uh, that's this on them? There's probably less enjoyment now because one game finishes and you feel almost like the next one's starting, the pressure, the build up for the next game. Um, when I played, you generally first started, you generally played Saturday afternoon. You didn't have to get up Sunday morning and go to recovery and you weren't required back at the club probably till five o'clock Monday. So you had a good 48 hours there where you could actually have some downtime and socialise with your friends and you know get your head around the next game the next week. But, you're straight back into it the next morning now, so it's a 
never ending sort of pressure and they don't get much of a release valve these days to go and you know just be themselves I guess. It's been an eventful time at Punt Road for you over 17 years. Has there been a more eventful year than the one that we're experiencing at the moment? Yeah, I don't think so, Mike. It's been, you know, I guess it's been fairly horrendous. If you look at it uh, from the start of the year up until now, it's been one of those years where absolutely nothing's really gone right for the club. It started off, you know, hitting all the right notes in the pre-season and, you know, everyone got their expectations up, the players and obviously the fans alike and everyone in the footy world, I guess, was sitting back and thinking, you know, could this be the year uh, we finally sort of make some inroads? But uh, right from round one on, nothing's really gone right. You know, senior players have got injured. Um, you know, we haven't won games, obviously. Terry's departed. So, yeah, it's been a pretty bad year. Can I take you back? You won't like this, but I need to take you back to yeah. round one. Yeah. You had a shot in the first 60 seconds, I reckon. It looked like it was going to be a goal all the way. Yeah. It clips the woodwork. I think you were celebrating at the time. I mean, isn't it funny that I'm not suggesting a season can turn yeah. on something like that, yeah. but it would have been the dream start, wouldn't it? Yeah, I did. Uh, I can't remember who wrote it, but after that, after that game, a few months later, someone said, you know, I hit the post in the first 60 seconds, and it sort of was that a, a sign for the year to come. And you know, who knows if it goes through? Maybe you know things turn out a bit differently that night. Maybe we we get a roll on, but it wasn't to be. Um, you know, they got off to a flying start and it was like the wind was just taken out of the sails and, you know, that's a, you probably that shouldn't happen, you know, we should have been able to be res more resilient than that, but I think the expectations and then to be so far down so early, a lot of guys probably lost their way a bit in that game. What a win. Round four, you played the game that you just couldn't afford to lose under any circumstances. There were no alibis that day in Melbourne. You lost that. Did you think then that, uh, that it was over for the year? Well, I didn't think the season was over. I mean, you never probably think of it that way, but you looked at the draw, we probably had to win two out of the first four games. And I guess the Melbourne one, you know, after that, it was like, gee, we're really gonna have to do a lot of hard work here. And uh, that was the one that fans, you know, everyone was really disappointed after the Melbourne game, definitely. What's been the darkest period in your time at Richmond? Oh, particularly dark. You know, where you wondered where not necessarily yourself because your form's always been pretty good, but where the, the club was going, whether there was, whether there was any light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, I guess when you're inside a club, you're probably a lot more optimistic than what people outside are. And I mean, every year you genuinely go through pre-season tra training and you genuinely think, you know, it's going to be a good year. Um, I guess if you ever start thinking that it's not going to be at that stage, I reckon that's a pretty good sign that you probably shouldn't be playing. Uh, so I don't think I've ever really had periods where I've been, you know, totally doom and gloom about the whole thing. Obviously this year's been testing, really has, but uh, if you looked at the whole scheme of things this year, probably be the, the worst point. But I wouldn't say it was, you know, darkest hour, doom and gloom. How did the club handle the, uh, the coaching change, did you think? Look, I think uh, in, if you sat back, all things considered, I don't think they could have done a hell of a lot more. I mean, uh, there was pressure on even before uh, the end of last season, you know, people were talking. Then obviously huge expectations this year, everyone talking finals. Uh, it had publicly already been stated that if we didn't make finals, uh, Terry had said it and the club had said it, if we didn't make finals then there probably wouldn't be a, a contract at the end of that year. So the media from round one built up every single week, it was on, it was on every time you turned up at training, there were cameras there. Uh, there was another article every, every two days after every game. When it got to the point where finals were totally out of the equation, uh, I think for the best, uh, for Terry and for the footy club, I don't think they could have done it much better, really. 29 years since your footy club has won a premiership. Has there been one single fault in your mind that stood out as to why this football club has been in the wilderness for so long? Oh, jeez. One single fault. Look, I think over the, generally over the last 10 years, they used to blame it on the coaches changing every two years. Well. You know, two coaches have had five-year terms, so I think they've been reasonably patient on the coaching front in the last 10 years. I mean, everyone tries to talk like we change coaches every two years. That did happen during the uh, 80s, but uh, in late 90s there were a few changes quickly, so I don't think you could blame it on constantly changing coaches. Um, I mean, in hindsight, you can look back at draft picks probably gone wrong and development of players, trading for senior players. I reckon in hindsight you probably would have just gone down the path of sticking to your draft picks and not trading and probably trying to develop your own. There probably have been some mistakes there and I think everyone 
uh, probably knows which ones they are. What's been the highlight of the journey so far? Uh, definitely, I mean, finals footy, <laughs> thanks for pointing out, I've only played three, so I definitely remember them, don't worry about <laughs> that. Uh, probably the winning game against Carlton, MCG 2001, uh, you know, a bit of rival, arch enemy type of thing, Carlton, to beat them in a final was a pretty big highlight. And then we went up to Brisbane the next week, you know, we, if that had, net final had been in Melbourne, who knows, we could have maybe done better and Brisbane were a pretty handy side at that stage, they were about to win, you know, three flags in a row, so yeah, we just copped a bad year to probably make a prelim. What about personally? Yeah. What's the favourite memory for you, for um, you in an individual sense? Um, yeah, individually. I think last year was fairly satisfying individually. To change positions at the start of the year after three games, I was, you know, would be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit worried about where I was at. You know, I knew the club was looking to develop other forwards and obviously that needs to happen. So to get moved to a wing, I didn't know how it was going to go. Was I, you know, was I capable? I did have a few doubts there, but it panned out fairly well. So I guess at the age of 33 to change positions and actually have a solid year and you know, get all Australian selection and have a, have a good year personally. We didn't make the finals, which is disappointing, but yeah, I guess if I look back, that was a fairly satisfying year. You have got a massive engine. I mean, is that something that you're born with or is that because of the result of all the time that you spend in training? No, I think always at school, I was always good at cross country and long distance running. So I think you are born with a certain aerobic ability, but you then need to keep working on it. And you also have to have the ability to, to keep pushing yourself. I mean, I know there are plenty of guys that have got a good wind tank if they do the, the max test on the treadmill. But game day, you need to be able to you know, dig deep and push yourself. When you've got an opponent on you, it's easy to stop running. It all gets too hard. So you've got to have a good mental toughness as well. After the break, Richo talks about the time he nearly quit the game and how he likes to spend his time away from footy. You've won just the one best and fairest when you were 32. Have you been harshly treated? Uh, phew. Well, I think generally speaking across the board, if you look at BNFs and you know individual awards, they're generally won by midfielders. And I think as a forward, it's, it's harder to have a consistent year week in, week out. As a forward, you're going to have dry days just by the nature of the way the games are going. And best and fairest, the way the voting systems are now, it really rewards the guys that are consistent every week. But, uh, you know, you might not necessarily have outstanding games, but you're just doing your job each week. So I wouldn't say I've been treated harshly. But you must be pleased that your name's on the board. Look, I'm, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't, you know, walking into the club and as you walk into our gym, the, the board up there with all the Jack Dive medalists is right in front of you as you walk in. So you often glance at it. And I, I'd be honest by saying I'd looked up at it probably 15 years into my career and didn't see my name there. Would have been disappointing to not got up there at some stage. You've never been captain. Disappointed? Yeah, I'm disappointed. I haven't been captain of Richmond. Uh, I just don't think the timing's been right, the last two appointments. Uh, I think my chance was when, when Kane got mm. the job. Um, you know, I put my hand up then and wanted the role, but in saying that, Kane was an outstanding captain and was ended up, he was voted in by his peers. So, um, yeah, that was probably the, the chance I thought I probably had. And at the end of the day, I, I wish I had it been, but sometimes you know, one or two small faults can sort of get in your way, and I reckon sometimes you just got to back people in a bit more. What are the one or two small well, faults? Well, I reckon the reason I haven't never got it was because of perceived body language mm. issues and those type of things. Mm. So, you now that's my fault as well. I needed to straighten them out earlier than what I did, but I think that probably cost me an end. I'm, I'm intrigued, like a lot of people, about that body language. I mean, yeah. your universe, everyone loves you and, and, uh, and, and the Richmond faithful do it. And yet there were periods where it would just surface, wouldn't it? You'd, for something had happened, a pass would be misdirected or yeah. they'd ignore a lead and you would not erupt, but you would sort of clearly be not happy. Yeah, I guess uh, as a person, I am fairly emotive in the way I express myself. Um, and playing footy, you know, that's where, you know, I get my most enjoyment so I guess I guess my most frustration there as well and I, early in my career and right up until probably three or four years ago I didn't display display it in the right manner and it can have a negative effect on the team a lot of the time though people probably misconstrued it a lot of the time I was more frustrated at myself than any teammates 
Maddie, explain to us what happened that fateful night against Carlton at the MCG. The nation watching on Friday Night Football. You led. Yeah. Maddie Knight's miscued. <laughs> you didn't seem to like it. Yeah. Uh, and you ended up back in the seconds the next week. Tell us what happened that night. Well, what happened was Maddie Knight's passed it to me, um, and I was leading out. And on the footage, I clearly slow up and then have a, uh, a mouth some words at what everyone thought was Nida. And it does look like that, but the whistle actually, Nida kicked it and then the whistle blew and I was reacting to the whistle blowing and I was more annoyed at what, what had happened, that the play had been pulled up for some reason. Now you might get the replay out and it mightn't have even happened like that because <laughs> I can't really remember. But everyone thought I'd blown up at Nida and it, was, it did look like that, but it actually wasn't the case. So it sounds like I'm making an excuse and everyone will think I'm lying, but I'm not. But I actually did a few things that night. I then, um, Dave Roden went to handball to me in the square and um, I probably reacted, or I did react the wrong way to Dave, who was a young player. And it was probably more over that incident that I went back to Coburg. You kicked 91-49 in 1996. Why do people say that you can't kick for goal? I reckon you've had a few <laughs> cracks over the years, Mike. <laughs> well, I think everyone has. Look. At the end of the day, you know, I've missed some real sitters, you know, real shockers from two, three metres out, and people really remember them. But if you actually have a look at the overall percentage, it doesn't look too bad. But I reckon when I have a miss, I have some really ordinary big misses, and that really sticks in people's minds. The one, the one that always gets me, and you start defending yourself when you, <laughs> when you get bagged about it so much, but. I had a look at it one day and I thought, geez, I'm, am I that bad a kick? You know, everyone goes on about it. And I had a look at the percentages and I think at the time I was 60% and Bernie Quinlan was 56%. And I thought, hang on, wasn't he called Superboot? <laughs> so I thought perception's a big thing in football. Now, I don't mean to, to sway you from that, but the ones when you miss and kick yeah. it over the fence, they don't come into those things. Hey? Yeah, you're right, though, there. Oh, the ones when you say 40 out and you just not quite carry the journey? Which one are you talking about out on the full? Correct. Yeah. Well, they don't record them. So. Could, that's right. So it doesn't it, it, look, I don't want to lay. I don't want to. So you're saying I've had a lot of out in the full. <laughs> I think there's been the odd one. You can't <laughs> back it up with stats though, mate. So don't I bring can't. it up. I know, I can't. I can't. On those rare occasions when you do miss a goal, you get any advice from, uh, from the, uh, the public? Yeah, we've had plenty of advice over the years, Mike. Uh, I did kick well one year when Disco Roach took me. I should get him back down. He was uh, probably the best teacher I had, but the, the stupidest bit of advice, or it might be smart, I never tried it, but I got a letter from a gentleman one day and he uh, wanted me to throw back to the early 1900s and bring back the place kick. <laughs> and probably not a bad idea if you look at it because the ball is sitting still, there's no movement, but can you imagine the flack I copped if I set up for a place kick and then mucked it up? I don't know how you guys have reported on that. <laughs> You've been 13 times leading goal kicker. It's a staggering achievement, I reckon. I mean, it's twice more than Skinny Titus, and he kicked 970 goals. Um, I mean, that's that's a, a great thing that you must a great reflection of your career to be that consistent in that area of the game. Yeah, I guess uh, 13 times is it, you know you look at it and you go, gee, it's a lot. I've never really been someone that's kicked massive bags of goals. I mean, Skinny Titus was always kicking 80 or 90. Uh, goals every year and then Michael Roach kicked over 80 probably four times in his 600 but I guess I've been good from a 50 or 60 goals a year and um, you know I've, I've been glad I've been relatively consistent across the board for that I guess. Is kicking for goal is it yeah. is the problem with it for anyone is it technique or is it the mental pressure of having to kick the goal? Look well, there's definitely technique involved um, I've probably got a high ball drop you know I've got long long legs and I'll probably drop the ball a bit high. So if there's anything, there's any wind in the, in the air or the ball's a bit slippery, you know, that can cause a fair few problems. But I think m most of it's probably up in your head. You know, you get negative thoughts. If you miss a couple early, it probably can set in for the day, so. Where are you most comfortable? If I said you, you've got to kick me this goal, yeah. where would you put yourself? Probably right on the goal line, <laughs> straight in front. <laughs> <laughs> if I miss one from there, I will abs I'll give up football. I'll say it here now. If you miss one from the goal if line. If I miss from dead centre on the goal line, you can write this down. I'll retire on, on the spot. I'll walk off the ground. Can I have a bloke on the mark or not? You can have someone on the mark. <laughs> no, nah, in all seriousness, probably, 
probably um, 45 to 50. You know, you probably kick it more naturally. You don't try and poke at them. You have to kick with a, your full distance. So probably that would feel the most comfortable. So is there one miss in your career that, that uh, oh. torments you or not? Oh. Was it one against Footscray one day at the MCG that? You're loving this, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Matty, I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> You've been amazingly durable, but there's been lots of pain along the way, hasn't there? You had a knee reconstruction? Yeah, I've had a lot of injuries. Yeah. I think I've, I reckon I'd be up to nearly 80 games missed now through really? injuries since yeah. I started. So, you know, there's been a lot of hard work in between overcoming injuries. So I saw the, I remember the knee at the SCG. Yeah, I had a, I had a knee reconstruction. Um, 2000, I missed the whole year, 19 games. I did my foot, basically a foot reconstruction. Then this year I've had the hamstring tendon injury, but in between I've had lots of you you know, forearm things. I broke my arm twice, I've broken my wrist, both my cheekbones, both my thumbs I've had done. So, and then a lot of you know hamstring strains along the way. So, ever get to a point though where you where you know the pain and the interruption yeah. to what you what you're doing? Whether you had to, do you get to a point where you ever weighed it up whether you wanted to keep doing this? No, not really. About six weeks ago was the closest I've been, I reckon. <laughs> what, when you did your hamstring? Oh, I was just running laps. Um, it was about four degrees and it was coming in sideways the rain. I reckon for about two laps I thought, geez, is this worth it? You know, 30, 34 years of age. But, I mean, that went pretty quickly. Once the session was finished and, um, you know, I got on to the next day, I was still pretty motivated, so. So 2010, as we sit here at the moment, that's in your plans to play another year? I guess at the start of this year, I always thought I had a couple more years left in me. Um, I've hardly played any football this year, so if anything, my body probably feels fresher. You know, the rest of my body having this long a layoff. So, you know, I'd always plan to play 2010. I'll definitely want to have the discussion with the club at the end of the year and see whether they think the same way. Who have you most enjoyed playing with in yellow and black? I love playing with Benny Gale. I really, because when he went into the ruck later in his career, um, some of the marks he used to take in the back 50, you know, standing in front of full forwards and getting his back caved in, taking strong marks. He always knew he'd take them though. Like, I really enjoyed playing with him. Um, Matty Knights was, you know, huge talent. Um, enjoyed playing with him. And then obviously Wayne Campbell was, you know, his consistency week in, week out. Uh, they're probably the three. Of the latter day players, you know, I've enjoyed watching Brownie. I mean, unfortunately, that broken leg really uh, hindered Brownie since the day he broke it. He hasn't quite been able to get back to his best, but before that, there were about 10 weeks before he broke his leg. I reckon he was pretty close to the, the most talented you know, player I've played with. What about your toughest opponent? Oh, toughest. There's been you know, a lot of good players over the years, but uh, probably the last 10 years, you know, I've never, ever been able to get a kick on Max Hudgeton. You know, Fev says that. So I would... I would reckon he's hugely underrated in the overall scheme of things. Is that because it would, from the outside looking at his closing speed's good and he's got yeah. long arms? Is it? Um... He uh, he's got good closing speed. You know, you think you've got him on the lead, but he gets there and gets a fist in. You know, he's good. You know, one on one, he's strong. He's got a big body, um, and he's good at just getting you tangled up when you go on the lead. He, you know, you put a hand on your hips and you lose a bit of balance and very hard to get away from. So, you know, he's right up there. Played your first game in round seven, 1993. Tell us your memories. Yeah, played the Saints at the G. We didn't have a good year. We only won four games, but we won that day. So that was a good memory. I played on Sputter uh, and Jamie Shanahan. And I, got a, I went all right. I got a, I've got a few marks and a few kicks. And I remember Spud told me he was going to belt me if I kept running. I don't think he enjoyed me running around <laughs> the old Spud Regis. But, uh, so that made me run more. I mean, I wasn't... Uh, able to mix it physically with him at that stage so he just wanted to wrestle did he? he I think he thought if I kept running he was going to give me one he probably would have got away with it back then too <laughs> you've been on good footy money's good money you've been on footy money for 17 years have you used it yeah I reckon I've been fairly diligent with it and you know I try to tell the young players now to you know you don't know how long it's going to last so while you're playing put as much of it away as you can get a property under your belt as quickly as you can, I think, because if you're only around four years, at least you could, you know, have a good deposit and whack a bit off a house, and you know that's probably better than most people our age. So, yeah, I guess over the years, I think I've tried to be fairly smart with my money. When you're not playing football, when you're not preparing for football, when you're not recovering for, from football, 
What do you do with your time? I like I love uh, music. I like to try and get out and watch a band as often as I can. Getting harder these days. Um, so yeah, I like my music. So that's a passion outside of football. Yeah, I like I like just you know getting away from it in that regard. I've got a few mates that uh, are into into building. I've got a builder as a mate and. We've just bought a, a small property we're going to do up, so I enjoy that sort of thing as well. Do you follow a certain genre of music, or is there a band you go and see or what? Yeah, probably indie rock, sort of uh, alt rock music, I'd say. Um, at the moment, I'm listening to Kasabian's new album. That's not bad. <laughs> I haven't understood any of this last year. So <laughs> was... What do you like? I like a bit of the old stuff too, though. Give do me you? one. You give me one. Elvis? Yeah, Elvis is good. I like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Simon and Garfunkel? Uh, they not yours? No, probably a bit too mellow. You know? <laughs> thanks, Matthew, and good luck for the rest of the season and the rest of your career. No worries. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. Richard,